Hey everybody, how you doing? Steve Livingston here, good to be with you. In 2002, Eric Winemary was the first blind man to climb Mount Everest. He said this about his experience. Being blind, I knew that no matter how good of a climber I'd become, I wasn't going to get to the top of Everest alone. After an ascent of Denali, I was fortunate to meet Pasquale, PV, Scaturo, at an outdoor retail trade show. Full of bravado, PV is a modern-day swashbuckler, he said. He approached me and said, I've heard about you. Have you ever thought of climbing Everest? And in the next breath, he asked if I wanted him to lead the expedition. Assembling the rest of the team required careful selection, he said, of the climbers with the right background and a high level of trust. We turned down a couple of amazingly talented climbers who felt would interfere with the team's cohesion. It's interesting. You ought to pay attention to some of his language as he describes this this story and about what he had to go through and the obstacles that he's faced. That's kind of one of them, a small one. He, he recognized there was a need for unity. He goes on to say this. Once the final selections were made, we decided to climb Amadablam, Blom to test our skills and build our team's strengths in a real Himalayan environment. From the start, our climb was plagued by terrible weather. Though we got close to the summit, we ultimately decided to retreat. During the descent, Eric Alexander took a 150-foot tumble that banged him up pretty badly. Although we were all good climbers, as yet, I didn't have any indication that we were prepared for Everest. But when Eric fell and went into shock, the team really stepped up. First, our laid-back doctor, Steve Geip, kicked into gear, retrieving the cache of oxygen bottles we had set aside for emergencies, racing back up to Eric and slowly nursing him down the mountain. The rest of us, much higher up, worked through the storm, carrying down loads. Without any prompting, different team members took up turns guiding me down that icy ridge in the darkness and wind. Around 1 a.m., we straggled into base camp, thoroughly spent. Surprisingly, that crisis didn't shut us down. Instead, it catalyzed us from a group of individuals into a real team. A month before we were ready to leave for Everest, Eric was still having lung problems from his injuries that had developed into pulmonary edema. He hadn't been able to train most of the year. He told me I should kick him off the team. Eric, I said, people have been counting me out my whole life. If I did that to you, what kind of hypocrite would that make me? He thought a moment and said, then I guess I'll go. I don't think I'm strong enough to get to the summit, but I know I'm strong enough to help you get there. On our summit day, two of my teammates, Brad Bull and Jeff Evans, were out in front or faced with a dilemma. At the base of the south summit, they looked up to see two sets of fixed lines. On the left was a relatively easier route for sighted climbers, but climbing jumbly, unconsolidated rock is a lot of harder for me. The snow slope on the right would be a lot easier for me, but that rope was buried a foot under a recent storm. Instead of ascending the rock, Brad and Jeff spent two brack baking hours pulling up the ropes free, exhausting work at 28,000 feet. For me, what was even cooler than my reaching the summit was the fact that 19 of 21 of my teammates reached the top that day. The most climbers from a single te- team to reach the summit in a single day. Lots of experts said my climbing was a big mistake and would result in a disaster. Instead, we made history. Guys like PV, Eric, Brad, Jeff, and all the rest of my friends stepped up in a hundred different ways that made the difference. More than 10 years later, I still look at this team as the best I've ever been a part of. And by the way, each team member, member has used that experience to do great things in the world. Luis Benitez went back to climb Everest six more times. PV rafted the Blue Nile from source to sea. Our base camp manager, Kevin Chirilla, led a quadruple amputee to the top of Kilimanjaro. Others have climbed Himalayan peaks with blind Tibetan teenagers who are ostracized in their society because of their blindness. Right now, teammate Charlie Mace is attempting Everest West Ridge as a part of a team sponsored by First Ascent. Go get him, Charlie. That's what Eric said. Last year, we all got together to celebrate our 10th anniversary by taking a team of soldiers injured in Afghanistan and Iraq up, I hope I say this right, Labuche, a 20,000-foot peak near Mount Everest. We've just recruited another team of injured military to take part in the second Soldiers to the Summit program. And you can learn about that at a place called No Barriers. Well, I love that story uh, by Eric um, Winemary as he talks about his experience and the various things that he had to overcome in his commitment to seriously, as a blind person, climb 
Mount Everest, something that most of us who can see wouldn't commit commit to. Commitment. Commitment is an attribute or character. It's it's a quality that combines a couple of a couple of things. The first is determination. And the second is a destination. So these two D's that I like to call them, the first is determination, is, is a firmness of purpose. It's a, it's a resoluteness. It's, it's basically the process of establishing something exactly the way you're thinking and feeling about it. The second is a destination, the place to which someone or something is going or being sent. And these two principles, determination and destination, really do require an individual to have serious concentration, serious focus. When someone is committed, there's an inner strength that comes and builds inside of you. But you can't just talk about it, dream about it, or even even just think about it. It means to act and not be acted upon. Well, what do I mean by that? What does it mean to to be acted upon? It means it's it's really hard to live a committed life if you're always aware of the burdens of life, those from the past, the present, or even the future. The reality is we have the capability to always move forward and grow from every situation. And and so listen carefully to this next statement I'm going to share with you. If you wake up every morning and rake up the manure, it will always stink. So what do I mean by that? Well, we put manure down to basically as a, a fertilizer and it gets hard and it stops to stink. But most of us, we get up every single morning and whatever's happened in our past or going on in the present or in the future, we go out and rake it up every single morning which causes life to stink, for lack of a better term. So I say, be committed, one small step at a time. Big things happen that way. Climbing Mount Everest is big, but it only happens one step at a time. Now, when you're faced with an obstacle, remember, that's life. Figure out a way around it, go over it, uh, go through it, but get past it and keep moving forward. So I say, commit already. Commit with determination, and make sure you clearly know your destination. So next time, we'll talk about what that means in going to higher ground. Seven daily success principles you have to commit to. Well, enjoy talking with you, and we'll talk to you later. Have a great day. Okay, everybody, uh, just hope you're enjoying the, the day-to-day uh, uh, video blogs. I uh, just wanted to invite you, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, go out to Facebook, to The Living Stone Life, and uh, like my page, follow me, and I'll be posting things all the time, at least two to three times a week. Uh, also, if you want some of the previous uh, articles that I've written and uh, video blogged about, go out to stephenlivingston.org, and you can uh, find out uh, all the uh, the material there. Anyway, uh, it's been good to have you, and I hope that you'll... Uh, You'll follow me and look forward also to uh, my podcast that is going to be beginning called Slipstream. Anyway, you guys have a great day and we'll see you later.